everyone, and welcome to today's broadcast, The Evolution of Diverse Ubiquitous Crest DNA Viruses, presented by Siobhan Duffy, Associate Professor, Department of Ecology, Evolution, and Natural Resources, Rutgers University. I am Alexis Krause of Labberts, and I will be your moderator for today's event. We are delighted to bring you this educational web seminar presented by Labberts. Labberts is the leading scientific social networking website and producer of educational virtual events and webinars. Before we begin, I would like to remind everyone that this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want at any time you want during the presentation. Just click on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen and type your questions into the box that appears on the screen. Our speaker will respond to your questions via email. If you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, please click on the Ask a Question box to let us know that you're having a problem. This presentation is educational and thus offers continuing education credits. Please click on the Continuing Education Credits tab located in the top right corner of the presentation window and follow the process to obtain your credits. Please join me in welcoming Siobhan Duffy. I will now turn the presentation over to her. Hi everyone. I'm here today to talk about a group of viruses, the circular rep encoding single-stranded DNA viruses that you might not have heard uh, much about before, but we now understand are a very diverse group that's present in almost everywhere in the environment. There are many kinds of viruses. There are double-stranded DNA viruses, like our own genomes, single-stranded DNA viruses, which I'm going to talk about today. But probably when most of you think about viruses, you think about RNA viruses. Viruses that have diverse but RNA genomes are common pathogens of humans, causing diseases like rabies, influenza, rotavirus, or HIV. And these are the kinds of viruses that humans care the most about, the ones that infect humans themselves. You may be able to think of an example of a double-stranded DNA virus, for example, chickenpox. But most people would be hard-pressed to come up with an example of a single-stranded DNA virus. The group of viruses I'm talking about today are not going to be all of the single-stranded DNA viruses, but most of them. There'll be viruses that share a number of traits in common. I'm going to be focusing on the circular rep encoding single-stranded DNA viruses. They have a circular single-stranded DNA genome, and they all encode a homologous ORF, the replication-associated protein. The rep is not a polymerase, but it assists the polymerases of the cells that these viruses infect in replicating these viral genomes. We are knowing so much more about uh, Crest DNA viruses, especially the ones that infect eukaryotes, because of a commercialization of a polymerase, the 529 polymerase, it's marketed as Templify or Genome Fee, that does rolling circle amplification of templates. It's proven very useful for amplifying very long stretches of eukaryotic genomes, but it, pr it preferentially amplifies circular single-stranded DNA, meaning if there are any Crest DNA viruses in your metagenomic sample, if you're using this polymerase to do your metagenomic analysis, you're gonna get an over-representation of Crest DNA viruses, and such many people have turned into inadvertent Crest DNA uh, viral discoverers because of this. And we found Crest DNA viruses basically everywhere people have looked. This is a semi-exhaustive search of the literature of the last 10 years, looking at all of the different locations where completely novel species of Crest DNA viruses have been found. This isn't including uh, places where people have used, have been looking for Crest DNA viruses and found novel strains or novel types of viruses that we already knew about. These are places where people found something that looks very different than anything else we'd previously known and merited at least the measure of a different species. While I've colored in land masses here, the Terra Oceans Project has been an invaluable resource for finding novel Crest viruses. We found Crest DNA viruses in Antarctica, et cetera. It appears that every place we look, we can find some. Perhaps eventually we'll saturate the diversity, but we keep finding a lot of novelty as we find more Crest DNA viruses. And in fact, while 
the last decade has been a fantastic one for viral discovery all around, I'd argue that it's been the decade of Crest DNA viruses compared to almost all other viral groups. If you look at the situation of how much we knew about this group in 2011, at the time of the ninth International Committee on the Taxonomy of Viruses report, there were only three families that represented uh, Crest DNA diversity. All of the animal infecting Crest DNA viruses were in family Circoviridae, and we were sure that they infected mammals and avian hosts. And there were two groups of uh, highly unrelated groups of Crest DNA viruses that infected plants, the Gemini Viridae and the Nano Viridae. The Gemini Viridae are segmented. They can have one or two uh, genomic segments. Circoviruses all have one segment. The nanoviruses can have many segments uh, ranging from six to 10, each, each of them individually encapsulated in their own uh, capsid shell. If you compare the diversity from 2011, uh, well, I have some pictures here of the kinds of diseases caused by a circovirus, a uh, beacon feather disease on the top. I have an example of a Gemini virus causing uh, mosaic disease symptoms on an ornamental plant, albutalon, in the middle. And the devastating effects of the nanovirus banana bunchy top virus are shown at the bottom. That is a full grown bunch of bananas and that's a 12 inch ruler. So clearly these diseases can have some substantial economic impacts on the crops in which they uh, occur. If you compare the diversity that we had in 2011 to today, when the 10th ICTV report is uh, still in progress, we now have doubled the number of families and have a net number of five new genera and existing families, and we still haven't uh, systematized a great diversity of the Crest DNA viruses that have been discovered in the last decade. We have uh, diversified the range of hosts that we know that can be infected by or associated with Crest DNA viruses. I have to say infected by or associated with because we have very few examples of some of these novel groups of viruses where we have a host where we've been able to fulfill Cox postulates. Uh, for example, we have a uh, family genome of Viridae. I have a little fungal symbol there. There's a single well-characterized example from the genome of Viridae that infects fungus. Everything else that's in that family is associated to, uh, with that species because of uh, sequence similarity. All the black pluses there are where we include a range of viruses that have been found in environments, metagenomic samples from seawater, from grinding up an animal where you could get viruses that infect the animal, could infect something the animal just ate, could infect something in the holobiont of the animals, perhaps the protozoa that are living in association with the animal. So we're sure that the Bacillodinaviridae uh, infect diatoms at least, but they, we found them in many other, in association with many other different kinds of eukaryotes. The circoviruses, we've now expanded the diversity of their hosts to not just mammals and birds, but fish, invertebrates, uh, both marine and terrestrial. And they've been found in association with a whole lot of other environments and hosts, but we're not as sure that they are infecting those hosts. The genome viridae I mentioned, one infects a fungus, who knows about the others, but we found them in a lot of different environments. And there's a revolution here for the taxonomy of viruses. We have an officially categorized family of Crest DNA viruses, the Smacoviridae, where we have no cultured members, where everything about creation of this family is about a group of uh, similar sequences that have been found in many different environments uh, in several different continents. And we don't have a definitive um, measure of any of their hosts. So these viruses are, they're, they're much more diverse than we had a sense of 10 years ago. And they're infecting hosts that we don't necessarily, we, we don't have a great handle on their host diversity yet. Because we know most, mostly about these viruses through their sequences, I'm gonna talk about three related molecular evolution projects that my lab has been working on, trying to understand the diversity of Crest DNA viruses. First, we're going to talk about the nucleotide level genomic evolution of some well-studied single-stranded DNA viruses. This was part of the PhD thesis of Yimei Xia. She's now a postdoc at University of Washington, Bothell. Then I'm going to talk about uh, our efforts to create a phylogeny uh, based on the homologous rept protein that all of these Crest DNA viruses share. This has been part of the PhD work of Lila Zhao. 
And then I'm going to talk about some efforts that my lab has been putting into how to classify novel CRESS DNA viral genomes when all we have are, are their sequences to go on and to try to do things that are complementary to sequence similarity, which is how we typically identify uh, novel virus sequences. We, we blast them. And that's the work of a postdoc in my lab, Eric Lavington, and a graduate student, Alvin Crespo. So starting with Yimei's project on molecular evolution. Single-stranded DNA viruses frequently have their bases unpaired and hanging out in the environment uh, open. This is a different situation than what we see with single-stranded RNA viruses. I have a model genome. It's a solved structure of an RNA virus, the bacteriophage MS2, uh, here on the screen. You're seeing lots of stems and loops. Basically, the single-stranded RNA, as much as possible seemingly, is trying to make itself into double-stranded pairing. That's a much more stable configuration for um, making sure the bases don't get degraded, and it can help the virus package itself in an optimal way. That's not what we see with single-stranded DNA viruses. I can't show you an analogous picture. We don't have any solved structures of single-stranded DNA viruses in the same manner. But here is an electron micrograph from 1982. The two top circles are porcine circovirus 2, which is an animal infecting crest virus. And below it are the uh, genomes of single-stranded DNA bacteriophage 5X174. And yes, they've been prepared for uh, photography, but they don't have the same kind of tight single-stranded uh, binding itself onto itself uh, in all sorts of regular ways that we see in SSDNA viruses. This is RNA viruses, I apologize. And this is a quote from a 1991 paper. I uh, was looking at the spectroscopy of single-stranded DNA viruses when they're encapsulated inside their, uh, when they're inside their capsids ready to be transmitted to other hosts. The spectral signature of the vast majority of SSDNA from the native virion is that of melted SSDNA, i.e. DNA lacking the ordered B form backbone. What this is basically saying is that inside the capsid at least, Single-stranded DNA viruses don't show a lot of evidence for having regular secondary structure. That means that their bases are more frequently unpaired than on RNA viruses, and it's an unusual situation to have SSDNA uh, durably uh, in situations because SSDNA is pretty labile to chemical degradation. The most common kinds of damage that happens to SSDNA are oxidative uh, damages. This happens to our human DNA. Our frequently transcribed genes undergo a lot of oxidative damage uh, in, in the manners which I'm going to talk about. Oxidative damage uh, can target three of our four DNA bases. Um, there are all different kinds of transitions, or in one case, a transversion that can be encouraged by oxidative damage. But by far, the most common kind is cytosine becoming deaminated into uracil eventually leading to a C to T transition. This happens all the time in our frequently transcribed genes. This happens in all cellular genes that are frequently transcribed. And life appears to have learned to cope with this because all cells have an enzyme called uracil and glycosylase that goes around and repairs this exact kind of damage. When uracil, which is not supposed to be found in DNA, is found, it's repaired preferentially back to cytosine because of the actions of a DNA repair pathway starting with UNG. So CDU deamination may be occurring to single-stranded DNA viruses more often than to most kinds of life, especially since single-stranded DNA viruses don't appear to have access to the host repair enzymes like uracil and glycosylase. But it's not just that oxidative damage might be uh, pushing SSDNA viruses to have this as a frequent mutation. There are also enzymes within cells, for example, within mammals, that are part of our innate antiviral defense mechanisms that act on single-stranded DNA and can cause CDU uh, deamination enzymatically. The best known group of these uh, enzymes would be the Apivec family. Uh, they are responsible for hypermutation phenomena in HIV. That occurs when HIV is in its single-stranded DNA state, its single-stranded DNA of uh, HIV that's having its cytosines turn into uracils. And so this could also, these enzymatic antiviral uh, defense mechanisms could also be encouraging CDU deamination in SSDNA viruses inside the host. If CDU looks like it's going to be a signal of a, a potential mutation bias in single-stranded DNA, 
we asked whether or not we could detect this mutational bias in the long-term evolution of these viruses. Would we see a bias substitution pattern over evolutionary time? I'm going to show you an example of how we did this analysis using a CRES DNA virus that infects plants. This is East African cassava mosaic virus. I have a little picture there of its effects on a cassava plant. And the way we, attract, we attacked this project is to create outgroup rooted maximum likelihood trees for whole genome or for uh, single genes when uh, whole genome information were not, was not available. This, in this case, it's whole genomes, such that we would have all of the genomes of interest available in GenBank at the time of our analysis and we'd have a sister group. In this case, it's in green on the bottom of the screen, South African cassava mosaic virus, helping us try to figure out what the root was of the phylogeny. Then we, we, we built this tree using a, the most complicated kind of phylogenetic model that is implemented in uh, most programs, which is called the general time reversible model. It allows every pair of substitutions to have a different substitution rate occur at a different rate, faster or slower than uh, the other pairs of substitutions that could occur. But if you'll notice, all of these arrows are bidirectional. If A turns into T at a certain rate, T has to turn into A in the exact same rate. We then got rid of the ancestor, the um, outgroup in our analysis because all we needed the outgroup for was to help us root the tree as accurately as possible. And then from the potential theoretical ancestor of the viral group, we added up all of the substitutions that occurred over evolutionary time through the phylogeny. We then used a chi-square test to compare these observed numbers of substitutions to what we'd expected. If our assumption used in tree building was correct, and for example, A's turn into T's at the T same rate that T's turn into A's, well then adjusting for nucleotide frequencies of A and T, we have a strong sense of our expected number of substitutions that uh, could occur uh, compared to the actual number that we, uh, we tallied. Our results for East African cassava mosaic virus are shown here. On the left, we have the ancestral base across the top, the base that it became. When the chi-squared value was significant at a 0.01 level, we've shaded it in gray, showing an overrepresentation relative to expectation. And there are three kinds of substitutions that were overrepresented in EACMV, G to A, C to T, and T to G. G to A and C to T substitutions are what one might expect from significant oxidative damage. Uh, these are both transitions for G to A to be occurring so much more often than A to G. That is consistent with oxidative damage, same with C to T compared to T to C. We're not really sure why T to G would be elevated in this particular, uh, in this particular uh, CRESS DNA virus. As you'll see on uh, upcoming slides, there are some idiosyncratic uh, substitution over representations that may very well represent uh, adaptive evolution or odd effects of drift that have occurred in these uh, individual lineages. But I'm going to show you the same kinds of results, not just for EACMV, but for a range of CRESS DNA viruses on the upcoming slides. I just want to also tell you that while we see this in the long-term evolution of EACMV, it's also something that people have noticed in the short-term uh, experimental evolution studies they've conducted using a different plant infecting CRESS DNA virus, uh, tomato yellow leaf curl China virus. A group in China found that uh, C to T and G to A transitions were dominant in their lineages as opposed to T to C and A to G transitions. While we're seeing this as a long-term substitution pattern, other groups are finding that this is occurring as in short evolutionary uh, periods of time as well. This is not a, just an artifact of a long-term analysis. So here I'm showing you the overrepresented substitutions for a range of single-stranded DNA viruses. Uh, Phyx-174, which is a bacteriophage, then B19 and Canon parvovirus are two linear SSDNA viruses, but all of the other viruses here are CRESS DNA viruses. Porcine circovirus 2, beacon feather disease virus, banana bunchy top nanovirus, East African cassava mosaic virus, and, MS and May streak virus, those are both Gemini viruses. The first four rows are the transitions, the bottom eight rows are transversions, and what should be apparent uh, here is that the most universal 
substitution that we see across the SSDNA viruses is that C is being uh, turned into the thymine potentially due to enzymatic deamination. If we compare these kinds of overrepresented substitutions from SSDNA viruses to other groups of viruses, we can uh, see how unique these levels of biases are. So here is the exact same data I just showed you on the previous slide. I've just scrunched it up so that I can show you additional viral genomic architectures as well. SSDNA viruses here in black, and then different genomic architectures. Positive sense single-stranded RNA viruses, so like messenger RNA, are shown in a bright blue. Negative sense single-stranded RNA viruses, so the complement of messenger RNA, are shown in a teal. Brown is a double-stranded DNA virus, and then um, beige is a double-stranded RNA virus. All of these groups of viruses, even the double-stranded ones, show some kinds of overrepresented substitution biases. We see more transition biases than transversion biases. We think this is solely due to the statistical power in our analyses. There are more transitions that occur over evolutionary time that are tolerated by selection over evolutionary time. So we're able to see subtle differences in transition rates in a way that's harder to do with less frequently occurring transversions. The second thing I would point out is that while C to T is by no means exclusive as a bias for single-stranded DNA viruses, SSDNA viruses are the most consistent in showing C to T transition biases across all different uh, genomic architectures. And the reason why it's important to talk about these kinds of biases and long-term uh, viral evolution for all groups, but especially the SSDNA viruses, is that, as we talked uh, about before, we build our trees using nucleotide substitution models that assume that forward and reverse substitutions occur at the same rate. Cytosines turn into thymines at the same rate that thymines turn into cytosines. If that were actually true during viral evolution, I wouldn't be able to detect a C to T overrepresentation bias. Those bases would have turned back into cytosines at some point in time. So because we know that the more accurate our models for describing biological phenomenon, the more accurate our results, we have to have nucleotide substitution models that can accommodate a bias. If Cs turn into Ts more often than the reverse, we can't have this double-headed arrow that the general time reversible model has. So instead, the most complicated model, uh, the fully parameterized nucleotide substitution model that people knew theoretically should exist in the, back in the 1980s and into the 1990s would be the unrestricted model. Its short name is UNREST. This was uh, proposed by Zihang Yang. Uh, he actually encoded not just the general time reversible model, but the ability to run the UNREST model into his program PAML, which is still frequently used for hypothesis testing in phylogenetics, but is a very poor model for building phylogenetic trees because it can't handle building a tree with more than, say, 10 taxa. Back in the 90s, he compared the fit of the GTR model and the UNREST model to two small data sets, all from uh, mammals, uh, one with six taxa, one with nine taxa, and said, you know, the UNREST model doesn't really get you anything better than the GTR model for these small data sets with mammalian genes. The use of the unrestricted model does not appear to be worthwhile. And for a long time, that's been the last word on the use of the unrestricted model. But if we can prove, as we have, that viruses have statistically detectable uh, substitution biases, it may be time to dust off the unrestricted model encoded into some of our modern phylogenetics programs and use it to describe viral evolution as accurately as possible. Viral evolutionary phylogenies are important because that's how we do molecular epidemiology a lot of the time and how we track outbreaks, sometimes in real time, across uh, countries that it's invading. To see whether or not the unrestricted model would help us model viral evolution better, especially for our SSDNA viruses, we took the trees from the previous um, analysis, these outgroup rooted uh, maximum likelihood trees that had been created with the general time reversible model, and we fit the unrest model to them in PAML. So we didn't build the trees all over again. We took a tree built with GTR and said, how much does unrest make it better, and is it worth all of those extra parameters? And our results are shown here. The change in Akaiki's information criterion is shown on the y-axis. Across the x-axis, we have our five genomic architectures of uh, viruses that we're highlighting here, black SSDNA, 
blue positive sense single stranded RNA, teal negative single stranded RNA, brown double stranded DNA, beige double stranded RNA. The change in uh, information criterion, if it's positive, it means the unrest model was a better fit to the data than the GTR model, even though GTR was used to build the trees. We also have open and filled diamonds here. That's because we ran a second statistical test, which is a likelihood ratio test. Because the GTR can be considered a subset of the unrestricted model, we compared the fit of, uh, of how improved the uh, unrest model was compared to the GTR using an LRT. The fill diamonds show uh, situations where the unrest was still statistically better despite penalization for extra parameters. You should see here that single-stranded DNA viruses seem to have some of the strongest benefits, the highest uh, values for improved fit because of the unrestricted model, but unrest overall was better for more than half of our data sets. This means that there's clearly a reason to consider building more complicated uh, nucleotide substitution models for people who work with all different kinds of viruses, not just the most biased group, which looks like it could be the single-stranded DNA viruses. So I wanna leave the nucleotide evolution of single-stranded DNA viruses for the moment now and go instead to a higher level protein uh, evolution amongst crest DNA viruses we have these biased patterns on a nucleotide level. Does that mean, should that inform our way of building trees on amino acid levels, comparing proteins of these diverse groups? So if we wanna build a tree of life, life for our Crest DNA viruses based on their truly homologous replication associated protein, that's great, but what matrix should we use to build that tree? Uh, my student Lila Zhao surveyed the literature from 2007 to 2017 to ask what are other people building their uh, Crest DNA rep trees with. And overwhelmingly, uh, she found that the two most popular models here were uh, in purple, RT-REV, that's reverse transcribing um, element matrix. It was created for retro transcribing elements, uh, transposons, HIV, a group of researchers who worked on this kind of uh, kind of uh, viruses and, and retro elements said, we're having trouble making our trees as accurate as possible. We need a specific matrix for our group of, of biological entities because they evolve a little bit differently. Their patterns are a little bit different from what uh, we see in cellular life. The most popular was a general uh, amino acid matrix called LG is the most modern of the general amino acid matrices to be released. It's based on a huge data set, but it's all based on cellular protein evolution. It does not include any viral protein evolution in this, its massive training data set. So what Lola tried to do was see whether or not the Crest DNA rep tree would be improved by making a matrix based on the evolution of the Crest DNA rep protein. She did this by creating an, a, a data set of over 900 rep sequences uh, from GenBank NCBI. Rep seeks uh, were used only, plus a few other sequences that uh, were created as part of the grant that uh, supported Lilla's work. This was an Assembling the Tree of Life grant from the National Science Foundation. And our collaborators, Maya Breitbart and Karina Rosario, were pulling up all kinds of crazy new uh, virals uh, sequences, most of which have already been published, but we, our data set includes a few 18 unpublished rep sequences at this time. Lilla then aligned them and uh, built a guide tree from the uh, alignment. In addition to just purely aligning the uh, data set with muscle, she's tr uh, trimmed it by uh, over half of the sites using uh, TrimAL and using the most common tool for determining what kind of amino acid substitution matrix you're supposed to use, protest, determined that the best fitting data set for our alignment was the VT matrix plus uh, G and plus F modifiers to the amino acid uh, substitutions. She then cut her data set in half. Half of it was used for training to uh, improve upon uh, matrices and to build a unique uh, matrix that was designed to fit Crest DNA uh, virus uh, rep proteins. 
Uh, she used two different protein uh, programs to uh, improve upon existing uh, matrices, FastMG and HiFi. She used two different uh, seed matrices, both the VT matrix because it was selected by protest and the LG matrix because it was the most common uh, matrix used in uh, previous uh, studies with Crest DNA viruses. She determined what, uh, how often one substitution would turn into another uh, from her improved data sets, and then tested the fit of those matrices against a test data set, the other half of the data set, so that one, one half of the data set was making the, tr the new matrix to fit the other half of the data set. There was zero overlap between the sequences used for the data fitting and the data testing and then compared the fit of the matrix using CODML and PHIML. She did this jackknifing 10 times, creating 40 total different fit matrices that were tested against uh, 10 different test matrices, test uh, alignments. The performance of these uh, matrices are going to be shown here. We have our 10 test sets across the top. Uh, the four FIT matrices that uh, Lilla created, FMGVT, FMGLG, FIT-VT, FIT-LG, and then three other standard amino acid substitution matrices, that RT-REV, LG, and the VT that uh, were already discussed. And here's a summary of the likelihood results uh, where darker is a higher likelihood and lighter color is a worse likelihood. Even though the VT data set was chosen by protest to be the best fitting for the entire data set, it was universally terrible for fitting each of our test data sets compared to other matrices. However, our fit, our individually uh, bespoke matrices uh, were often extremely good fits and the best fitting matrix for each of the 10 data sets are shown in the darkest color. One thing we were very curious about at this point was how different each of these 40 fit matrices were from each other. And here we're showing the results of a Pearson correlation of amino acid substitution rates within the matrices to answer that question for us. You have at the top left corner, VT, LG, and RT-REV are standard already created amino acid substitution matrices. And then the 10 FMGVT fit matrices, the 10 FMGLG fit matrices, and then the 10 fit VT and 10 fit LG matrices below it. Perfect correlation is the darkest brown. The lightest uh, color here, white, stands for a correlation of about 0.8. And what was very reassuring at this point is that all of the matrices that were created with the FMG uh, method were uh, very similar to each other. It wasn't that each individual training data set was giving us a very different answer. They were all circling around the same kind of answer. Almost any of the successful matrices would be similar if we picked from here. As it happened, we did a test to evaluate which was the best fitting of the uh, top matrices from each of the uh, training data set, from each of the testing data sets, and the best data set overall describing all 10 training data sets was FMGVT10, which we have renamed as the Crest matrix. And this is just a visualization to show you in terms of the size of the bubble how often certain kinds of amino acids interchange with each other. This is an unusual way of thinking about how proteins evolve. If you don't do a lot of work with protein matrices, this probably won't make a lot of sense to you. But what's a nicer way to compare this would be to compare the Crest matrix to some of those existing matrices. For example, comparing Crest to RT-REV on the left, Crest to the LG matrix in the middle, and comparing Crest to the VT matrix on the right. When the Crest uh, substitution matrix had a slower rate, it's blue. When it had a higher rate, it's brown. So overall, the Crest matrix is less prone to change than the retrotranscribing uh, RT-REV uh, model. It's similar in scale to the LG model with idiosyncratic uh, differences, certain substitutions more favored, certain substitutions less favored. And it's, in general, higher than the VT matrix, which had been the best uh, fit to the entire data set uh, used to start this study. We then created trees using the full aligned data set, aligned and trimmed data set, using the LG matrix, the VT matrix, and our new Crest matrix. I'm showing you these results with their taxa colored as uh, different tips, uh, 
blue, uh, so we have red for Bacillodinoviridae, yellow for Cercoviridae, green for Geminiviridae, a, a blue or green for Genomaviridae, a bright blue for a, a bright light blue for Nanoviridae, a bright blue for Smacoviridae. Pink are in class unclassified, so everything you see that's pink is not yet brought into one of the formal groups in ICTV or perhaps could potentially uh, found its own group someday. And purple are alpha satellites. Those are not viruses. They're molecules found in association with some viral infections, cross-DNA viral infections. And while I'm not going to show you all three trees all the time, I'm going to show you uh, all some results from all three trees put onto this single tree, which is the tree created with the Crestini matrix. This is a rapid bootstrapping Raxamil tree. The colors are just as I said on the previous slide up at the top right. Some of the conclusions we found that worked across all three uh, matrices building the trees are that uh, the bootstrap support was primarily found at the tips of the tree and not at the deep branches of phylogeny. Very normal for looking at protein evolution over a very long period of evolutionary time. However, we found some bootstrap supported um, events or some events with very low bootstrap support that were uh, common across all trees. Uh, for instance, all three of our trees agree with something that's been reported in the literature already. The family Nanoviridae it sits within the purple alpha satellites. So this is in the bottom left corner of your screen. This uh, family of viruses that are able to replicate independently, it's a multi-segmented, uh, multi-partite uh, family, uh, sits within a group of related viral elements that are not themselves whole viruses anymore. That had very low bootstrap support, but this is some, a, um, a pattern seen topologically in many people's analyses. Something that we observe that other people haven't seen before is that all three of our trees, based on our the common alignment, show that the family Genomaviridae makes a monophyletic group with uh, some Gemini viruses. It's the master viruses and a couple of the other uh, families of Gemini that all have an intron in their rep. The Genomaviridae also have an intron in their rep. So this is a very intriguing possibility here that perhaps the intron in the rep that creates the splice form rep can have a single origin for members of one family and all the members of a second family. And this is the first time we've seen this kind of association where the genomoviridae are monophyletic, but the geminiviridae are not. We have some of the geminiviridae forming this monophyletic group with the genomoviridae. We see that the taxonomy of Cercoviridae is going to get more complicated. Uh, Cercovirus, uh, uh, Cercoviridae is composed of two genera, Cercovirus and Cyclovirus. They've been uh, re taxonomically revised just in 2017, but they are placed all over the tree. We are not, um, we're seeing that there are some things that are still called Cercovir Cercoviruses that are probably going to have to be renamed or other groups that are going to have to uh, be created to help describe this diversity. I should mention at this point, none of the Crest DNA viruses are assigned to a uh, genus or family solely based on their rep sequence, and I'm only looking at the rep sequence relationships here in these trees, but we're seeing a, a huge amount of diversity here. One thing that our uh, Crest matrix did that the other matrices that we used to build trees with the same data set didn't do is we routinely saw that the red Bacilladinoviridae, uh, Mark Krupovic and Arvin Varsani are the people to ask how to properly pronounce this, uh, grouped more closely with another family, the Smacoviridae, than we see in the other trees. There was one Smacovirus, the dromedary stool associated Smacovirus, its rep always grouped with the reps of Bacilladinoviridae. That could be uh, an interesting evolutionary uh, relationship there, but perhaps these groups are closer together in general than some of the other matrices would have led people to believe. Most of the time when people have been creating these kinds of trees to look at rep diversity, they've been focusing on how much we don't know. This is a figure from a 2017 Nature Reviews Microbiology article 
where the colored branches are the well-characterized named classified groups of crest DNA viruses, and all of the black diversity, the overwhelming majority of diversity on the tree are from unclassified sequences. This could be one of the reasons why some of the things that we're observing in our crest uh, DNA rep only, but all of the rep analysis, we're seeing some patterns other people haven't seen before. Uh, we're going to have to keep looking and working with our, our trees to figure out what exactly is going on with the groups we see that are intermingled. Is there potential misclassification? Remember, the rep is not the sole determinant of classification uh, for what kind of genus and family these groups should belong to, but has there been horizontal gene transfer? Uh, Arvind Varsani and Mark Krupovic have a great paper that was out this year, Kozlowskis et al., uh, 2018, where they look at horizontal gene transfer in just the rep protein, showing that the two domains of rep have had significant recombination amongst them, not within these groups, but between these groups and in the unclassified uh, groups of viruses. Because most of the diversity of crest DNA viruses are known only by sequences, this means that we have to determine what genus and family uh, a novel sequence belongs to without having any other clues than the sequence in front of us. Most of the classification is done on uh, percent nucleotide identity. The, there are published uh, cutoffs for a threshold for a novel species, published uh, thresholds for a strain within a species. And one other important matter for uh, determining what group a virus sequence belongs to is the genomic orientation. Many crest DNA viruses are, are what's called ambisense. This is an example of an ambisense plant infecting crest DNA virus here. Uh, it has some ORFs in the complement of the viral sense, meaning that they're ready to be uh, transcribed into messenger RNA as soon as the viral genome gets into a cell. But then there's also the uh, coat protein, the capsid protein, over on the other genomic orientation on the same genome. It looks like messenger RNA now. The genome has to be replicated before you can create a template that the CP can be transcribed from. Whether the rep is in sense or antisense is one of the determinants to help you classify what kind of uh, genus your uh, sequence belongs to. The other determinant for what sense your genome is in is the circle at the top of this uh, schematic. It's the origin of replication for uh, crust DNA viruses. It is a loop of typically a few more than nine bases that contains a nine base sequence that the rep protein recognizes, starts rolling circle replication at, and can nick into single genome copies using its endonuclease domain. Uh, we used to think that these nanonucleotide sequences were pretty invariant. The sequence I, I have here was the invariant nanonucleotide sequences for uh, white fly transmitted plant crest DNA viruses. But as we've discovered more and more diverse sequences, the adherence, the diversity that we see within these nanonucleotides has grown to the point where here are the universal codes for the nanonucleotide sequence for circoviruses, gemmiviruses, genomaviruses, and smacoviruses. Lots of ends and ambiguous base calls in here. As our sense of how sure we should be about the nanonucleotide uh, as it erodes, we have less and less faith that we can call the genomic orientation of a, of a viral sequence solely based on finding one of these not a nucleotide sequences, you can imagine a situation where you could find potentially one on one orientation of the genome and you could reverse complement and find another. So one of the things we're working on is to try to find complements to classification based on percent nucleotide identity that can help researchers feel more confident in assigning their uh, novel sequence to a given uh, taxonomic group. The first one of these I'm going to talk about is a machine learning project that's been run by Eric Lavington. And the second one is going is a, um, a still developing project by a first year graduate student in my lab, Alvin Crespo, to look at whether or not codon bias can help us determine strand orientation. Very briefly, I want to mention some of uh, Eric Lavington's results. 
he found that comparing three different kinds of machine learning techniques, multinomial naive Bayes classification, a support vector classifier with a linear kernel, and a support vector classifier with a radial basis function as its kernel, uh, all could be trained to do decent classification on unaligned sequences of the replication associated protein, either as nucleotides, this is across the excesses, nucleotides, nucleotide engrams, that is looking at uh, single nucleotides, then dinucleotides, then trinucleotides, up to 12 in a row to see whether or not uh, we could find th those patterns of multimers would give us good classification. Codons, unaligned amino acids, amino acid engrams, again, monomers to 12 mers, and then finally aligned amino acids. And we could only look at support vector classifiers for those aligned uh, data sets. The y-axis is a measure of accuracy, the macro average F1 score. And what you can see here is that alignment doesn't help you that much compared to using unaligned amino acids. And that amino, using amino acids or codons, moving it to the level of protein coding or protein improve the accuracy of these methods compared to just looking at the nucleotides. To show you an example of uh, how we use the support vector classifier uh, for unaligned amino acids uh, to show that uh, machine learning was actually uh, pretty good at catching the uh, assigning these things correctly to taxon, is that when we had a trained SVC using 100% of our data set, not using jackknife training and test data sets uh, as the data that you're seeing here uh, were created with, it was greater than 96% accurate on assigning sequences to genus. Our accuracy was initially impeded by misclassification within GenBank. So we found some of the same mistakes that others found and have tried to uh, fix when they've done taxonomic revisions. So here is an example of, again, F1 score on the y-axis, so showing you accuracy of the machine learning tool, and then its performance on members of genus circovirus and members of genus cyclovirus unaligned rep sequences. In March 2017, uh, the model was very bad at predicting cyclovirus. It was actually the one of the generators I had the hardest time with. Turns out many of the things labeled cyclovirus in GenBank were inaccurate. When the labels were fixed, some of them were called circoviruses, some of those were called cycloviruses. Accuracy went up uh, tremendously. So clearly machine learning is susceptible to garbage in, garbage out, but with a well-trained uh, classifier, this is something that has nothing to do with sequence similarity in terms of alignment. This is completely independent of BLAST. We can find uh, evidence and support for taking a novel sequence and putting it into a certain category in a complementary way to using BLAST identification. Finally, because we've already substantiated that SSDNA viruses have this cytosine to thymine substitution bias, I'm going to show you that that bias causes a strand-specific codon usage bias that we can exploit to try to figure out what genomic orientation a viral, uh, viral genome is in. So here we have that model uh, plant crest DNA virus here with our rep and antisense and our CP and sense. If C to T substitutions are occurring on the genome, it's going to drive uh, sites that are less under less selection, for example, the third positions of codons, to enrich for thymine in the code protein. We're going to see uh, NNC codons turn into NNT codons, not hurt the fitness of uh, the virus that much because they're calling for the same amino acid often, or a very similar amino acid. But we're going to see the opposite pattern accumulating in the rep protein. The thymines in the genomic rep uh, antisense protein are going to turn into thymines those will call for the complement adenines in the uh, codon bias of the transcribed messenger RNA molecule. This uh, is based on data from a paper from a graduate student of mine from a few years ago, Daniel Stern Cardinal, with a couple of undergrads who worked with him. He measured the relative synonymous codon usage of 15 well-sequenced bagomavirus species. These are plant-infecting crest DNA viruses that all infect dicots. They all are infecting hosts that have the same codon usage bias, which is slightly AT rich. And uh, his results are shown here. For the coprotein, uh, there was 
there are a number of overrepresented preferred uh, codons. Many of them do end in T. For the replication associated protein, we don't see the same pattern. Even though they're transcribed at the same ribosomes, if there were selection to match the, the uh, transfer RNA pool of the host cell or the speed of replication of the ribosome, you'd expect similar codon usage for both ORFs. We see that uh, mutationally biased pattern where we have an enrichment for NNA codons in the replication associated protein, corresponding to an enrichment of TNN uh, codons in the virion sense. So my student Alvin Crespo is taking this and in Ambisense genomes, he's using the hypergeometric distribution to see which ORF is overrepresented for TNN uh, codon use. So the hypergeometric distribution says, we're, you're asking what's the probability of seeing K codons in T in this ORF before we get to the end of the ORF. And we're assuming that the T ending codons are proportionally distributed. He adds up the number of T ending codons in the rep and the CP, and then says uh, if the rep is 60% of that data set and the CP is 40% of the, uh, the size of the ORFs in that data set, then what's the probability that we're going to see more than 60% of the T ending uh, codons in the rep before we get to the end of rep, for example. And he's seeing that he can very strongly detect that uh, the pattern holds for the vast majority of members of these groups, but we have a couple of rogues that uh, we, we can detect. So here is a different genus of Crest DNA virus, cyclovirus. It's one of the, uh, the genera in Circoviridae. It has the same pattern as the plant infecting uh, Crest DNA virus I showed you previously, where rep is an antisense and CP is in sense. Uh, the p values here are the probability of getting to K T ending uh, codons prior to the end of the protein. We're seeing that the vast majority of cyclovirus sequences, about 45 of them, uh, c correspond to this where our p value is very, very strong and low for the CP. You're getting to the, the T ending codons in time. And it's really, really terrible for the rep encoding uh, sequences because they're enriched for NNA, they're not enriched for NNT. You're very rarely getting to the uh, number of T ending codons in time. But we have a couple of sequences that are misbehaving and there's symmetric distribution to their misbehaving. If uh, because of the way we're calculating the data, if it's more likely that the rep's getting there uh, before the end of its protein, then we're seeing a terrible performance for the CP and vice versa. Uh, these two sequences we've looked at in some detail, and they have different stories so far. The one on the left uh, clearly looks like this is a flipped orientation cyclovirus. Uh, we can see the correct cyclovirus non-nucleotide uh, pattern, but only when we flip the genome to be the opposite sense. So this looks like something that was put into GenBank in the wrong orientation, it should be uh, complemented and, and the file should be updated. However, the stronger evidence against it being in the correct orientation is found in the example on the right. And it's not a nucleotide is definitely in the right place, but it's codon biases of its two ORFs look like it has the flipped orientation. This is something that we haven't um, been able to find a satisfying answer to. This is one of the limitations of doing computational research instead of being able to experimentally probe these things. My best guess at this point is there could have been a recent recombination event that flipped the orientation of the ORFs such that they're now newly in a cyclovirus orientation. The sequence similarity are clearly the cycloviruses. Um, so maybe the nanonucleotide section was a uh, product of a recent recombination event? I don't know. It would be wonderful to do an experiment uh, if you could get this kind of sequence into culture. It's not, it's, an, it's associated with a bat, it's not grown in bat cells, and to use experimental evolution to see if its codon use changed over time it, as it was being reared um, and, and continuing to grow in this way. But we can find some examples that might be helping us correct the way that viruses are input into GenBank or to help us expand the diversity in our understanding of these genera. So the project is working well. Uh, in, in terms of comparing the data set from March of 2017 and May of 2017, the same way that Eric Lavington did, this method alone was able to find all but one of the misclassified cycloviruses. 
it could be a useful method for helping people who find Crest DNA viruses that are amb uh, ambisense in terms of how to assign their genome and make sure that they're putting their genome into GenBank and the likely orientation. But we also could be expanding our understanding of what these genera can do and maybe assign it having their sense that they're always 100%, they've got to be in this kind of genomic orientation might be incorrect. And as we know more about viral diversity, this method can help us realize that the genomic orientation is necessarily as sure of a way of classifying the viruses as we would, might hope. To summarize, I talked about a few of the projects my lab's working on, trying to make sense of the diversity of Crest DNA viruses that are uh, being continually discovered and put into GenBank. Single-stranded DNA viruses have the strong cytosine to thymine bias that can affect many aspects of their evolution on a nucleotide level. Uh, we found that Crest DNA viruses uh, on the protein level, uh, they require uh, complex evolution models, both for nucleotide and uh, they need something more bespoke on the protein level. Our Crest DNA matrix was the best fit by protest for the rep genealogy once we were able to implement it and encode it into protest. So it's not just uh, the fact that we had created it from portions of the rep data set and we think, oh, that must make it good for the data set. Using the same tools that uh, people use to figure out which matrix they should run for their own data sets, Crest matrix showed up as the best. And finally, we are working on a couple of BLAST independent methods to help classify novel sequences, and they appear to work as well as uh, people examining these things in depth. They found the same errors as were uh, corrected in the revisions to Circa Vera in 2017. We had many people helping with this project. I want to thank especially our collaborators on the NSF Assembly Tree of Life grant, uh, Maya Breitbart and Karina Rosario from University of South Florida. Uh, we had a number of people contributing to the Crest DNA uh, protein matrix project, including Li Li, uh, Eric Lavington, Lil Zhao, and Alvin Crespo are all invited, involved in all different aspects of that project. Uh, Yime and Dan Stern Cardinal contributed to two parts I discussed before the molecular evolution of SSDNA viruses and their codon bias. And Hector Zari and Lauren Chagrala were students who worked first semester in my lab on the codon usage bias project that eventually became Alvin's hypergeometric distribution project. And so with that, I'd love to take questions. Thank you, Siobhan, for that informative presentation. We will now start the Q&A portion of the webinar and we'll address some of the most commonly asked questions by our viewers. If you have any question you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just click on the Ask a Question drop-down box located on the far left of your presentation window, type your question into the box that appears on the screen, and click the Send button. Our speaker will follow up with your questions via email. So let's get started. Our first question is, how important are the Crest DNA viruses in terms of economic impact and causing disease? So some Crest DNA viruses cause significant uh, economic impact. The groups that we were well aware of prior to the change in sequencing technology that allowed us to understand all this hidden diversity, uh, the Gemini viruses, the nanoviruses, and the circoviruses are all big agricultural pathogens. Uh, the Gemini viruses are the biggest uh, limit, limitation to crop production throughout the tropical and subtropical world. So they have billion dollar impacts. In terms of disease outside of agricultural settings, we realize there are a lot of diseases we don't know the cause of. And as people are employing metaviromics as a way of trying to figure out if there are any viruses associated with diseased animals or diseased plants, we are going to uh, figure out that some Crest DNA viruses that we previously hadn't associated with disease may very well be uh, causing some disease. But uh, they, they already have an outsized economic impact and it could be higher in the future if, as we understand more. And our next question is, it seems like there are more complicated unrest model would improve the accuracy of phylogenic modeling for many types of viruses. Why isn't this something that viral, uh, excuse me, that viral evolutionary biologists test for routinely? The reason why it hasn't been something that uh, people have tested for is a, a 
there are a few reasons why. Number one, no modern phylogenetic software implements it. Uh, at this point, uh, a couple of widely used phylogenetic software programs routinely search for rooted tree space. And if you have, um, if you don't have arrows going in both directions, they're not bi-directional, they're only going one direction, you have to have a really good sense of where your root is, where your ancestor is, or the matrix doesn't make sense and it can't uh, help you model your tree. Uh, the Bayesian methods, uh, BEAST, uh, RevBase, these could implement these kinds of uh, complicated models. They just haven't been uh, implemented easily yet. I'm, I have a lot of hope that the RevBase project will do so. Uh, other than that, it's faster and easier to search unrooted tree space, which is what you're, you can do if you have a bi-directional model. And it may not make a big difference for cellular data sets. And, you know, humans are, are cellular. We work mostly with things that are bacteria, other eukaryotes. If it doesn't affect their phylogenies as often, it hasn't been something that people have been calling for. Viruses may be the first group to truly need this to model uh, their biological accuracy. Maybe other groups will figure out that there's similar substitution biases that they that their uh, phylogenies could be improved by modeling more carefully. But because the, the field's not been driven by viral evolutionary biologists, it hasn't been something that people have implemented into the commonly used programs. And it looks like we have time for one more question. Do you think that we have gotten a handle on CRESS viral diversity? Or is there much more to be sequenced and categorized? Well, we definitely haven't categorized it yet. Um, arguably, there are unclassified and uncategorized uh, sequences associated with uh, CRESS DNA viruses by, by their rep sequence similarity. About as many, as much diversity not classified as we have classified. So I think that the, the task of, of systematizing the group is vast and untackled. It, it, it's, it's not quite tackled well yet at all. In terms of diversity, I don't know when we're going to see saturating levels of diversity from sequencing projects. Uh, people are going out and pulling up random samples from a lake, uh, random samples from an odd animal, you know, and a bug that no one's ever thought about sequencing the viruses from before, and it gets ground up, and we, we pull something novel out of it. I'm not sure. I'd hope we've covered about 50% or more of the diversity, but I don't think we're anywhere near saturation yet. I think there's still a lot of true diversity to be discovered here. I would like to once again thank Siobhan for her presentation. I would also like to thank Labberts for making today's educational webcast possible. Before we go, I want to let everyone know that today's webcast will be available for on-demand viewing for December of 2018. You will receive an email from Labberts letting you know when this webcast will be available for replay. Please share that announcement with your colleagues who may have missed today's event. That's all for now. Thank you for joining us, and we hope to see you again soon. Goodbye.